Okay, good afternoon. Good, uh, good evening. Okay, can we have your attention? We're starting now. Um, it's great to see so many of, uh, of you here. I'm uh, David Hume. I'm the Executive Director of the Global uh, Development uh, Institute. Um, and it's my great privilege to be able to chair this first uh, of the Global Development Institute lecture series for this year. There's a whole series of lectures over semester one and semester uh, two. I've got a great program which Tom Gillespie's put together. Do take a look at it because I think you really uh, find it excellent. Um, we're particularly pleased to welcome um, new friends. I think we have a lot of MA and MSc students here. I can spot the PhD students, but it looks like we have a lot of, of newcomers. We particularly welcome uh, you uh, to Manchester to the first of these lectures, and we hope that you'll uh, come, come along to them. Um, at your stage in life, then, you know that coming to university is not simply about passing tests and exams. You actually, we assume, are here to learn and to think about how to make the world a better place. And these lectures are a major part of that program that bring you thinking that's on the cutting edge of the social sciences, sometimes of the sciences, and helps you to think about what sorts of ideas may be the ones to take forward. So it's a privilege to be able to open the series, but it's even more of a privilege to be able to do it with Diana Mittlin. Um, Diana is Professor of Urban uh, Development at the Global Development Institute. She's the Managing Director of the Global Development Institute, one of the directors of the Manchester Urban Institute, and in some of her spare time, she also works quite a lot at the International Institute for the Environment and Development in, uh, in London. Um, so she's pretty busy, but it's great to have her here. Um, but you can watch out for Diana. If any of you jog in any of the parks around here, it's Diana who shoots past you. Because she does five jobs, she has to run very quickly to get her exercise in. And so if somebody shoots past you, it's almost bound to be Diana. But uh, you won't see much of her because she, she moves very quickly. Diana's going to be talking about shelter inequalities um, and, uh, and looking at lessons from urban India with this. Um, but Diana's someone who's worked on urban problems and urban opportunities um, throughout her career. The last few years then, certainly urban development and poverty reduction in urban areas has become quite popular. But Diana was working on these topics and issues well before they'd be, uh, be, become uh, popular. Um, most of the work, I think, that one will come across on what's happening in urban areas has a sort of top-down flavor to it. If it's coming from economics, it's perhaps looking at macroeconomic uh, processes or looking at investment opportunities from a, a, a top-down uh, perspective. If it's looking at governance, then quite often it's looking at what the national government is doing with the local government, and then civil society fits into that uh, framework. It may be looking at globalization, the way that social and cultural features are spreading from some parts of the world into other parts of the world, the spread of consumerism from richer nations to poorer nations. But Diana's focus throughout her research uh, and her career has been much more actually to invert things, to take a grassroots perspective, to see what's happening on the ground, what people are doing, how people are acting together, how they're making collective action, or why they're not able to act collectively, and then seeing about the forms of relationship that they develop with wards and councils, with local governments, and perhaps with the national government. So her perspective has very much looked at civil society and the role that the people who choose to live in urban areas can play in creating livelihoods and creating systems of governance that will allow them to achieve their goals and to give their children um, decent lives. Diana is going to uh, give us a, like a, a fully detailed talk, but there'll be quite a bit of time afterwards for questions and answers, so we'll move on to those afterwards. If something really hits you from the lecture, then do get a nice concise question uh, down that you could pose to Diana after she's finished lecturing. Um, and so Diana will now talk to us about addressing shelter inequalities, lessons from urban India. Can we welcome? So thank you very much, David. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, okay. This is not... Is this going to work? Yes. Okay. So thank you, yeah, David, and it's fantastic to see you all here. I feel quite conscious, self-conscious, 
For those of you who are master students, that over the next few weeks we're going to be asking you to stand up and do your first presentations. So it feels a little bit fitting that I am here launching this series, and I'm very conscious of the names that are going to follow me, because I think, as David said, the team at GDI have really gone to some effort to bring you some of the leading voices on development thinking. I wouldn't include myself in that group. But what I wanted to do in launch the series is talk to something that goes to really the heart of what we're trying to do at the Global Development Institute. The name Global Development was a very intentional reaching out, a real sense that the challenges the world faces are no longer compartmentalized into North and South. I feel the theme I'm going to talk about housing is very much one of those themes. And it's a theme that is, is very topical of the moment. So hopefully, I'll give you a bit of a flavor. Those of you who are not familiar with this issue, I'll give you a bit of a flavor of the challenges that are being faced in the Global South and give you a sense of why, why they might also be relevant to some of the challenges that are being faced in the Global North. I'm going to talk quite a bit about not so much the problems, but I'm going to start with the problems. Mostly, I'm going to talk about how civil society in India, one particular civil society group has tried to address that problem. But I think it's, it's worthwhile reflecting a little bit on the nature of the housing challenge. I'm sure those of you from overseas were shocked, as was the population in the UK when they saw the fire in Grenville Tower. And they saw the challenges that those people faced and arguably the people who had tried to address their housing need the challenges they faced and how badly they would failed. I think anyone who has been following the earthquake in Mexico sees similar housing challenges. Paradoxically, despite these difficulties, mass housing, the mass housing agenda has indeed been one, been one of the growing issues that many governments in, in the global south have been thinking about addressing. In Latin America particularly, there have been long-standing programs. In some Asian countries, long-standing programs. Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, mass housing is rising up the political agenda. So when I look across the experiences at Grenville Tower and other places like that, and indeed the experiences that I know, I think there are really three challenges that come out to me. And much of what I'm going to talk about reflects on how those challenges have been addressed, or how groups have sought to address those challenges. The first challenge is an issue of resources, an issue of location, where people, low-income people, are allowed to live, are encouraged to live, permitted to live, and the conditions under which they live, the scale of investment that is put in to helping to address their housing needs, both from themselves and, in many cases, the state local authorities. So the first challenge is a resource challenge with those two dimensions, cash and location. The second challenge is a challenge around standards and construction. What are the processes of construction? What are the choices that are made around standards? What are the ways in which standards are secured? And the final challenge is one of voice and inclusion. To what extent are professionally driven housing solutions designed to enable those who live in the housing to be involved in making choices about what's provided. So I'm going to try and talk about how we can understand that through the lens of a project that I've been involved in in India. And I'll go on first to talk about the situation around of housing need in India. Then I'll talk about the project and the research and come back to the issues. So this project was actually launched in the mid-2000s, 2005, the Jalahawal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. It was a big step in India. There had been many attempts to address urban development needs, but this was the first national urban development project. There were two components to it. One of those missions, the basic services for the urban poor, particularly sought to address the needs of low-income people, low-income households, living in informal settlements or slums in Indian cities. So the objectives were to provide shelter, basic services, other related civil amenities to low-income settlements, security of tenure, affordable housing, 
water, sanitation, healthcare, education, and social security, a so-called garland of seven entitlements. This project rapidly became, or this submission rapidly became a housing program. I won't talk so much about that, but we can go on. If any of you are curious or you have perspectives, then please share them in the questions. My understandings about why those choices are made are partly because of familiarity, that is used to how the state is responding to the way in which informal settlements or slums have developed. Partly modernization, the desire by the state to represent a modern city, and partly the paybacks that get involved in handling large scale construction. But the modality, the modality of housing that is provided and the way in which it interfaces with the challenges that people face as they construct their livelihoods are really key to this story. So just to give you a little bit of sense about need in informal settlements, and maybe I should just go back to something that was on one of the early slides that I forgot to talk about. It is truly extraordinary to reflect on the shelter crisis faced in the global south. One in seven of the global population it's kind of probably this group, the whole, maybe a bit less than this group, of the whole of you sitting there. One in seven of the global population lives in informal settlements. Informal settlements are places which tenure is generally insecure. It doesn't mean people face an eviction threat, but it may mean that, or it may mean other forms of insecurity. It means the kind of services which you can take for granted in Manchester are not available. Things like drainage, rarely provided, so high risk of flooding. Piped water, sometimes provided, generally at a cost, probably unaffordable in the quantities that are emergency WHO rations. Sanitation, often not provided. Health, education, often not provided. Things like street lighting, often not provided. So the shelter crisis is truly extraordinary, and figures in India are broadly similar. Estimated housing shortage of about 19 million dwellings, so probably somewhere between 60 and 100 million people living in inadequate housing. Almost 100 million living in informal settlements, quite a high percentage, 18 to 25 percent of the urban population. So very high level of need. This program only addressed a small proportion of that. Something that is also meaningfully understood is that the deprivation that people face living in informal settlements goes well beyond the material. There's a kind of famous representation that seems to transcend many cultures, which is above and below the railway line. So railway lines are used to distinguish urban neighborhoods into those that are considered safe and those that are looked down on. One of, the things that many of you, or one of the things that those of you who study urban development in the global south will come across is the ways in which people are seen as being of less value and are treated with prejudice and discrimination because of where they live. So that sense, that sense of, of um, vulnerability, of having a precarious livelihood, a precarious citizenship, is very much a part of the reality of people who live in these areas. So this was a, the, the, the findings I'm going to talk to you about were drawn from a research project that I did within a research center that is based within GDI, Research Center Effective States and Inclusive Development. And what we did was we, we stood back and we tried to understand what are the ways in which the BSUP, the Basic Services for the Urban Poor Submission, what are the ways in which they've tried to address housing need? What can we learn from that about how to do more effective programming? What can we learn from that about the vision that states have, about the commitments they have to realize that vision, and the capacities or capabilities they have to drive forward that commitment? Most of this research was done between 2013 and 2015. In order to understand the realities faced by the beneficiaries of the program, we worked closely with a civil society alliance. That alliance was embedded 
in developing the BSUP in two of the five cities that we looked at. And the findings I'm going to report to you draw heavily on the experiences of those two cities. So they're an attempt by civil society to engage with both the problem of housing, which I've described to you already, and the ways in which the state sought to address that problem. Before I go on to talk a bit about the findings, I want to talk a bit about the nature of the Civil Society Alliance that drove this. Some of you will be introduced to one of the partner organizations through citizen-led development. They belong to a network called SDI. And the Indian Alliance, the Indian um, member, the Indian part, affiliate of SDI, is made up of three organizations. I'm going to go on to talk about the ways in which civil society intervene in state thinking and state action. So state conceptualization of solutions and state action to address those conceptualizations. I'm going to argue that the way in which civil society engages with that has changed the substance and we can learn lessons from that. But I don't want you to assume that all civil society interventions are the same, just as all governments and all states are not the same. So this particular civil society alliance is, is, a, is, a, is a genuine alliance, a coalition, a partnership between three very different types of agencies. And all three have been important in securing the outcomes that they've achieved in these two cities. So the first of those, the National Slum Dwellers Federation, is a somewhat traditional, community-led organization, mainly with male leaders, who, if any of you have been introduced to Chatterjee's writing, are very skilled at operating political society, a network of clientelist relations that exist between people who live in informal settlements and the political representatives and state officials that are engaging with them, in part to address their needs, but in part to address their own needs and interests. A second part of the alliance is a group called Mahila Milan. Mahila Milan are made up of women who, have, uh, who wish to improve their own development options, so who work together collectively to do that through saving together and developing new ideas for addressing need. The final part of this alliance is an NGO that was set up by actually six women who were completely frustrated with what they were doing before, which had been to participate in very uh, much, much more charitable NGOs. So they'd got disillusioned with that. So the strategy of this group is, the strategy of the group is that it is necessary to engage the state, but it is difficult to engage the state. So they see, they see the state as often hostile. Their experiences being evicted from pavement dwellings on the streets of Mumbai, that the state is hostile. But they don't see a solution except to engage the state. They think if they try and step aside, they won't get the resources they need. If they try and contest power, they are likely to be adversely affected. So they've developed a number of modalities that are designed both to address immediate needs, but to build a relationship with the state that is advantageous to them. This is a little bit more theory. I guess the slides will be put up for people. Nina, do we, do we circulate the slides? OK, so you can have the slides, any of you who are interested in following up. And I can provide the references, which I guess you won't get. But as scholars, you will need. So they try and engage with, um, in terms of theory, you can see a number of strands in the literature, which are somewhat similar to their engagement. So Peter Evans, writing in the mid-90s, talked about the way in which some civil, civil society groups worked in partnership with the state in relationships of embedded autonomy. So embedded, close relationships, but they sought some level of autonomy. They sought to be able to determine their own part of that relationship, their own future, their own ideas. Secondly, there's a literature around co-production and a which, around the ways in which social movements employ co-production or the joint provision of goods and services by the state in order to advance their own political capital and increase the opportunities and options. There's a literature from Andrea Cornwall about invited and invented spaces. 
the ways in which both the state and civil society try and create a space that enables engagement. It might be invited, i.e. civil society is somewhat disadvantaged because the space has been constructed by, constructed by the state, but they also have some, some capacity, some autonomy to create more favorable spaces. So these, all of these ideas somehow map onto what this group is trying to do. But its aim really is to build this critical mass, to get a critical mass of people involved with a strong enough voice to change the options that are attractive to the state, to try and trigger a rebalancing of power within that relationship. There is, as you would expect, critiques of their approach, which I won't go into now, but I want to mention them because you may choose to pick them up into the discussion. So their challenge is that these groups are too, too weak, that they have been co-opted by the governments they try and work with, who use them to add legitimacy to another political agenda. There's a challenge around the quality of construction. How good can civil society be at constructing? We can come back to that question because I think it's an important one. And there's a further set of literature actually that argues that if you look at what's happening in urban India, civil society is almost irrelevant because so many market-based opportunities are being created, in part related to state action, that households are operating a self-interest agenda and are stepping outside of civil society or using civil society. Okay, what do we learn about the BSUP? So, I'll show you, finally you get some pictures. Uh, this is very typically what's provided under the basic services for the urban poor. Certainly not unique to India. This is somewhat typical of what governments are good at doing in terms of housing solutions. So, I don't know, how, I don't know how, what quality of housing it looks like, but generally quite poorly constructed housing. Poorly constructed because the accountabilities were very weak. Poorly constructed housing, housing in apartments, ground plus three or four, generally how high you can go without providing lifts. That involves a relocation to the urban periphery and involves excessive costs being passed on to the beneficiaries. So there's an issue about cost sharing. There was a subsidy involved in the BSUP, but in some of the cities, the solution was too expensive for people. So they, there was a whole pattern of cost es escalation and those escalated costs were passed on to groups who did not have the voice they needed to challenge them. This was particularly a problem in the cities of Bhopal and Vizag, two of the other cities that we looked at. Medium rise housing is very difficult for certain urban poor livelihoods. So for example, people who need rickshaws, people who have little shops, provide services, barbers and so on, Medium rise apartments are very difficult for those houses. Relocation to the periphery is hugely problematic. You really don't have to look at much literature to realize this is the thing you don't do if you're trying to address the needs of low income groups. And indeed the BSUP policy documentation said that state and city governments should try and do in situ upgrading. But the attraction of relocation, the ability to acquire land in central areas, either for infrastructure or for other developments, led to relocation being a major agenda in three of the five cities. In one of the cities, it was a bit less of an agenda, and in the other city, arguably, they were too weak to have a strategic location. But location is really important. The location problems involved in the BSUP and the cities were exacerbated because in some cases the infrastructure had not yet been extended to the periphery of the city where the medium rise blocks were located. This is a, this is a set of pictures around the first phase of the BSUC in Pune. And I'll go on to talk a little bit more about the way it developed in Pune. But the first phase, what the government tried to do on their own was a relocation project basically took out informal settlements in relatively well-located areas. It built these beautiful blocks on the periphery of the city. It tried to move people to them. It failed. There was strong resistance in Pune to moving. So the city authorities faced a, a, a problem because they, of course, 
recognized that they needed to fill these blocks that they built. Really, it was the failure of phase one that led to an innovation, a creation, a new possibility in phase two. The authorities in Pune had a long experience of working with civil society, partly the group I mentioned, the Indian Alliance, but also other NGOs. So they actually started to engage the NGOs in order to try and get them to help moving people. And that opened the possibility that they didn't carry on building medium-rise apartments in poor locations with poor quality construction and inadequate services. Instead, the civil society groups, the Indian Alliance and others, were able to convince Pune government that they needed to change direction and shift to informal settlement upgrading, which, as I mentioned earlier, was the preferred policy option but was not the first thing that local authorities think about doing. Informal settlement upgrading produces much better outcomes. It's often very slow, but arguably building medium-rise apartments is also often very slow. But it involves people staying in place and improving the dwellings where they are. Because people are involved in the design, because people necessarily have to be involved if you're trying to re-block, shift a few people around, rebuild housing in an informal settlement, you necessarily have to have high levels of participation. It's built into the process. It is an imperative. At the same time, people's engagement enables them to control the costs much more easily. So the costs on this project, the Pune project in um, Yawada, the informal settlements, enabled more or less the financing that was originally intended to play out. There was another city in which this took place, Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar was very different from Pune. Much lower income, much lower capacity, no history of working with civil society to address the needs of low income groups. Indeed, like many other places, Orisha or Odesha, the, the state in which Bhubaneswar is included, is primarily driven by rural development needs. That's the political imperative, the political electoral imperative, and that's reflected in policies. So Bhubaneswar, along with other cities, had agreed to do BSUP projects. Unfortunately, their designs were so poor, their plans so poorly conceptualized, including the cost problem, that they couldn't find private sector contractors to take them on. One of the groups quite active in the area, a group working with low-income communities, was an, another NGO, the Urban Development Resource Center, who'd had some experience of working with the Indian Alliance. So in this vacuum that was created, because they couldn't find private sector contractors to take on the housing construction, the civil society groups, the Indian Alliance and UDRC, agreed that they, or proposed to the state and city governments that they do informal settlement upgrading, and the proposal was agreed for three of the four areas. Civil society had to put some extra money in, so it wasn't a perfect solution, but it enabled a different way of doing urban development to play out. It enabled the city and state governments to see the benefits, and it enabled a few key individuals, one being the Secretary for Urban Development at the state government level. It enabled key individuals to understand another way of doing things. So they made fairly slow progress, but steady progress. And actually, just last month, the state government granted land rights to slum dwellers a huge step forward in terms of giving people the tenure security they need to begin to feel that they are safe in their homes and to trigger a whole set of investment processes. So just a few concluding slides before you get a chance to ask questions. So talking to government officials particularly, but also talking to other people involved in the BSUP, consultants and advisors. It really seems that there are five things, five ways in which this particular civil society alliance contributes to realizing housing solutions. The first of those is designing new approaches. In this particular context, designing ways in which informal settlement upgrading could happen, designing those approaches in ways in which People do part of it, but you can also see how the state does, enabling solutions to be co-produced with the state. Secondly, in topping up the state financing package when it is 
poorly designed and is, in a sense, rolling out solutions which are unaffordable and where the costs are being passed on. This, of course, is a bit of a disadvantage as a contribution because it clearly limits the scale. But I think those are the kind of things where we have to understand housing and innovation as a process whereby those involved learn about solutions. But the second benefit is this additional finance. The third benefit, which actually also came out in, a, in, a, in one of the um, other activities that we looked at in Bhopal, the third benefit is the fact that because this was an alliance that worked across gender, so it involved women in low-income settlements and these traditional male-led organizations, but at the same time involved an, a professionally-led NGO that was interfacing with officials and technical specialists in the government. Because of this, these multiple layers, it enabled information to flow up and down the scales of government. And this really proved to be a critical intervention, which, as I said, comes out of other, other projects, other interventions. And it's important because frequently you get a commitment at the top in state and city government. But the top officials, even when you convince them to act differently, don't know what lower level officials are doing. So making information flow, ensuring their strong information feedback loops becomes critical. Fourth contribution was supplementing technical capacity, was being able to plan when dealing with government departments that had no planners, being able to design houses when the relevant people in the state failed to do that. So having those technical capacities. And the final contribution was addressing one of the failings that's very common in India and actually common in governments elsewhere, which is the fact they like to rotate staff. So you have staff that come into a project, that build up knowledge on a project, maybe over a one or two year process, and are just about clued up, and then they go. And this is one of the very common frustrations that civil society groups face, this rotation. But having a group embedded that has the ability to connect individuals that are committed to a process and pass information from one person to another person is really critical in moving forward planning. So why do they succeed and will it last? I think one of the things I haven't presented to you is the limited nature of the program. So this program was not, I mean, it was addressing large numbers of houses, but in the context of the cities, it was only addressing a small proportion. So I don't think we should be too optimistic about what I'm talking about. But why did, looked at in another way, why did it succeed in terms of these uh, themes that are part of the ESID framework, this Research Center on Effective States and Inclusive Development? An important contribution of civil society was changing the vision of what urban development involved. So well-meaning officials, the, the, the well-meaning ones and the not so well-meaning ones, often see urban development as being something where you produce modern housing. The idea that it might be more functional to do things that are around incremental change is quite unusual in that context. So having a vision of how to do things differently that is part of a big story, we should have a city that is inclusive, but is also the local manifestation of what that means. Secondly, enabling commitment of state officials to be realized. So in my experience, actually even beyond India, it's not hard to identify officials and politicians who are keen to do something. What they are rarely understand is how they do, how they can be effective with that commitment. So sharing ideas about how commitment can be realized is really important. And then building capacities. And three, these three capacities really come out. I mean, there were loads of practical capacities, like how you redesign a house that is falling down. But rising a bit above that level, there were three really important capacities. A capacity to dialogue, as I mentioned earlier, these feedback loops, the way in which conversations can take place, why, why very senior people might need an intermediary to engage with and talk to people that they see as way below them in terms of social status.
capacity to dialogue, a capacity to extend the state's territorial reach, which of course is what government wants to do. Government wanted to reach into these informal settlements, it wanted to formalize them, it wanted to collect taxes from them and sell services to them. And finally, a capacity to imagine. Imagine and realize new approaches, which goes back to the vision. So in terms of more generalizable reflections on how we can address the housing challenge, I just make four points, I think. Firstly, this ability to create new relationships is key. I mean, actually, you can see it if you're following what Westminster Council is trying to do with Grenville Tower. The ability to create a dialogue in which people who are experiencing disadvantage can be involved in developing solutions and have a voice that is listened to about the problems that they face. So building those relationships. Certainly in the Indian context, but actually also in other contexts that I know, this ability to transcend levels of the state is critical. It's often possible to get one part of the state to agree to a solution that is reasonably in redistributive and inclusive. It is much harder to get the state to work consistently on that agenda. And certainly from the research we did in India, we could see how important that was. Thirdly, to address the formalization of housing. So as I said, one in seven of the global population lives in informal settlements. And in some cases, they're likely to continue living in the informal settlements for some decades to come. But in the faster growing cities, where economic growth is taking place, the pressure to formalize those locations is really is, is intense. So trying to find options that ensure that cities of the 21st century do not exclude people because they have low incomes is critical. The interesting thing about housing is that not everywhere, but often there is some subsidy finance available. There needs to be much more, but there is some subsidy finance available. But as I've tried to show you here, the challenge is as much what you do with the subsidy finance as it is to create that motivation to provide subsidies. And if you can use the subsidy finance in ways that build a political platform that, that enables more finance to be claimed in that way, then you have, I would argue, the foundations for a much more progressive and transformative urban future. Thank you. And just to say, because I forgot to say it, there are no fire alarms programmed. So if the fire alarm goes off, you have to run out. Sorry, I forgot about that bit. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much then, Diana. Okay, we've got a rich agenda then for you to ask uh, questions uh, of Diana on that. We started off with the housing uh, problems, housing crisis that we have in the UK. Uh, we moved on to hear about... Uh, uh, an Indian uh, empirical experience, which has certainly proved successful in terms of a number of dimensions. Uh, Diana talked about the proximate reasons why it worked and then thought more broadly about what lessons one might draw out uh, to generalize from this, lessons that uh, would be of use in other parts of India, but might also be of use in other parts of the world, such as the UK. Now, we'll ask you to please, if you're asking questions or making a comment, we don't want a lecture from you. We'd like you to give us a really sharp, focused question. We'll take groups of about three, um, and then Diana will respond to them, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so... Do we want to know who people are? Are we going to... Uh, yeah, let's... If you could tell us what your name is and just what you're, uh, what you're doing here, whether you're a member of staff, uh, whether you're a PhD student, a master's student, someone who's walked in off the street and wants to understand the housing problems that the world faces. Um, so if you put your hand up and one of the mics will be brought to you, please talk so that everybody can hear you. Someone starting at the back there? Okay. And can we get this mic to somebody else so it's ready? Hi. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, I just want to say, uh, first of all, thanks to Diana. I thought that was really uh, an interesting talk and uh, some really good points raised there. Um, uh, so my name's Hani. 
I am, uh, I'm a student uh, here, but I'm uh, studying architecture. Uh, so there, I kind of, you can kind of see where my question is going to come from in, uh, in regards to what you found there. But um, my main question is, if I only have to ask one, is um, how involved do you think architects should be involved in uh, the governance and social policy in addition to just designing buildings? Because um, it's obviously something that has to be linked together. Okay. Okay, second question, we've got a mic over here. Does anybody want it? Anybody over in that direction where Emma is? Anybody want to ask a question? Hey, very shy tonight. No, we're here. Oh, you've got someone down here. Excellent, okay. We have to use the fiddle finger of face and choose a question. No, no, I don't think you can. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage participation. Okay, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Chloe. I'm a member of staff in the Global Development Institute, so I work with Diana. Um, I was wondering if I can get the question up on my phone now. This is quite interesting. Um, what lessons could civil societies in the UK learn around engaging disadvantaged voices? Okay, and the third question. Anybody over on this side of the room, or everybody's going to be very quiet and shy on that side of the room? Anybody else for a question? Okay, there was also next time. Uh, Khalid Nadvi, uh, Global Development Institute. Uh, Diana, thank you very much for that very informative uh, lecture. And I was wondering, um, you know, if you were to sort of talk a bit more about this particular coalition uh, in the Indian Alliance. What I found very interesting at the outset was you said, look, these are three very different types of organisations that came together: the the professional NGO the sort of the male-dominated community organization and then, a, and, a, and then a kind of a women's cooperative around the Mahalla Milan group thing. So in terms of collective action, how, how do these three very distinct sets of uh, community bodies, civil society organizations, actually manage to kind of coalesce? And again, you know, you talked about different examples, uh, the story from Pune where the, 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 the model around the BUSP didn't quite work, and then the case of Bhubaneswar. Um, so in, in, in terms of sort of, you know, collective action that actually does manage to bring about a, a propor outcome, one that actually builds effective um, low-income housing, how does these kind of different sets of civil society bodies manage to, to make that? collective action work because at one level one would argue that you know it's what divides them that actually becomes quite um, clear that you know these three bodies could actually become quite competing in terms of their uh, particular uh, sectional interests uh, and how they might work okay we take those three questions we've got someone who's going to start with uh, another question once we've had some answers do you want to give a little summary of the question and then provide some, uh, some answers and guidance. Okay, so maybe to start with the first one. I mean, <coughs> I think architects are important. Uh, I think they're important. That you, if you look at my experiences at uh, trying to advance a more pro-poor urban policy and programming in the global south, I think historically architects really have been one of the professions that has engaged with this. So if you look at urban development issues in the global south, for a long time they were ignored by the global north, development agencies in the global north. They were partly ignored because someone called Michael Lipton wrote a book about the urban bias. So if any of you think that academics are not influential, most academics are probably not that influential, but some academics are extremely influential. So Michael Lipton wrote his book, and a lot of northern-based development agencies, NGOs and government agencies, invested most in rural development. So in the absence of having alternative people, many small southern NGOs were set up by architects who were trying to work closely with people to improve their housing needs. It's not for all architects. Many architects go on to build glossy buildings. Architects that are interested in this agenda, as you suggested, have to spend a lot more time getting to know the realities that people face. But actually, in my experience, that's true of all professions. Where architects are particularly necessary 
is that many of the solutions around housing are too expensive. And much, my frustration is that many architects have not spent enough time working with people to get designs to be lower cost. So you have both a historic involvement and an important future agenda. I think the issue about what lessons civil society in the UK can take up is really interesting. Some of the groups, actually not the groups so much from India, but some of the community organizations that I've worked with in the Global South have engaged with community groups in the UK. The Indians have a little bit, but less so. One of the things actually that shocks them, many things actually shock them about low income, what it is to be low income in somewhere like the UK. One of the things that shocks them is actually they think that the government puts quite large amounts of money into solving the problem, but it is extraordinarily ineffective. In their view, much of what the government does reinforces poverty and inequality rather than addressing poverty and inequality. So they would challenge organizations in the UK to be more imaginative about the way in which they're understanding the problem. The other thing I think they'd say is that many organizations, many charities in the UK are highly professionalized. And when they engage with low-income communities, they engage with them in a very top-down way. So, for example, you might find residents of housing associations being consulted about maybe designs, maybe refurbishment, the way in which blocks are improved, but not being asked to think much more holistically about what that agency should be doing to improve their lives and the lives of others in similar situation. So they, they find our way of doing things quite top-down and, and, and not really interested in being transformative. That, of course, is a generalization. I, 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 they are, there are other kinds of groups in the UK who are trying much more to do these kinds of things, to build a bottom-up process. But one of the challenges they actually face is the UK is much more institutionalized than many of these towns and cities in the global south. So to develop alternatives is much trickier. I think the question you, re you raised, Khalid, is extremely interesting. I think, and I think there are different reasons for different groups. So the National Slum Dwellers Federation really spent quite a bit of time trying to go it alone in the 19, late 60s and 70s. They tried to go it alone in terms of building an alternative, attracting donor finance, trying to get the resources they needed to build their movement. So they were the first, they were the old, they're the oldest of these three organizations. They found, two, they found two very significant problems when they tried to go it alone. Firstly, they could not engage with the way in which professional donor agencies worked. They couldn't fill the, meet the reporting requirements, they couldn't meet the financial audit requirements, and actually things have got a whole lot worse since that period. Northern NGOs used to be much more flexible than they're now going. So they had problems complying, and they really couldn't go to scale without any external resources. They couldn't generate enough resources of their own to work at scale across cities in India. Second problem they faced is actually equally interesting. It was that bringing this finance into the community organization without any third parties created a lot of internal conflict. So groups were fighting each other for scarce resources rather than coming together to address their collective needs. So NSDF recognizes, or the leadership of NSDF recognizes the difficulties they had. To be frank, as you kind of implied, these groups spent quite a bit of time fighting as well as collaborating. But they kind of know that doing it on their own is tricky. The leadership of Spark, the NGO, recognizes that they cannot transform India as a professional organization. So they recognize that no matter how beautiful their documentation, how glossy their DVDs, how persuasive their arguments, how well connected they are socially, they will not generate the resources you need to truly transform cities unless there is no choice for the political elite. The poli political elite give up resources not because they are motivated, but because if they don't give them up, they risk losing more. So Spark recognized that they can only do limited amounts of work to advance this agenda if they're not working with a movement that can demonstrate mass 
that can bring thousands of people together in rallies, that can make that kind of mobilized political statement. One of the things that the leadership in NSDF came to recognize, which probably reflects the way in which urban relations change within the family, they kind of came to recognize that actually women are potentially smarter than men. When men started, when NSDF started its work, it would often contest it would often try and fight the state. When women got involved, they were much more nervous about fighting the state. So the NSDF, they would fight, they would push the women to the front, and they would try and, try and use that to make the state um, pull back. But they rapidly saw the women actually had very good ideas, and they could find ways to address material problems that their houses faces. So for example, evictions would often end in, in, in battles, the people would be forced back because the army and the police would be involved in the eviction, pavement evictions. All the belongings in the houses would be taken away and people would lose everything. When the women became involved, they went up to the police and they said, look, we know you have to move us off the pavement. Just give us half an hour, we'll take everything down. You can show then your superiors that the pavement is clear. You know we'll be back, so maybe tomorrow we'll rebuild our houses. So the police often knew people in the informal settlements. They were quite happy to reach an accommodation like this. To give you another example, the women worked out how to get ration cards. So India rations basic food stuff, but you need a card to get those rations. Living on the pavements didn't let you get a card. So over time, the male leadership came to recognize that the women could find ways to advance a material agenda that the men could not work out. So they came to understand that they would get more from working with women, and indeed, in many cases, these were families who lived together, sometimes men and women from the same families. So in the beginning, when Mahila Milan began to organize, they often faced big problems from men who didn't want them to travel. But over time, the women's leadership le came to legitimate their contribution, and these two actually work much more easily. The tensions tend to be professional community tensions, not so much tensions between, between Mihila Man, Milan and NSDF. Sorry, that was a long answer. You didn't say I couldn't make long answers. Okay, no, they were very excellent long answers. We'll permit that. I think a colleague down here has got the next question, and then a colleague a little bit further up on this side will ask one. Anybody on this side as Emma's coming down? Now, this side is very quiet. We're going to have to get some noisier people on, on this side. Okay, our colleague okay, thank, thank you so much. But if you put your hand up, if you've got a question, we'll fit a, another one in. Our colleague over there, yeah. My name is Peter. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, this one question, which will uh, comment, which will lead to a, a question. I was really not surprised when you said that the former sectors uh, often resi resisted relocation. I think most of the times we realize that uh, policymakers tend to miss the bigger picture. They tend to uproot these people from their sources of livelihood. So, it, so in essence, when you say that, I was really not, uh, really not surprised. But uh, the issue of upgrading the resettlement, I think that is a better alternative, which will lead me to my question now of uh, the issue of land rise to the uh, informal set settlers. Though it is a noble gesture uh, to empower the, these people, you realize that uh, they are land barons uh, who, who end up uh, perhaps uh, 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 buying these uh, informal uh, pieces of land or something like that. So what I wanted to understand is uh, what uh, uh, measures uh, uh, will be put in place to ensure that uh, these incidents uh, do not okay. Thank you. The purchase, yeah, the way in which land gets sold. Thank you. Uh, I'm Adila Zubair. I'm the postgraduate student of development economics. Uh, actually, if you can elaborate a bit more on the role of civil society and to what extent civil society can cover up for developing countries, governments, low capacity in provision of adequate housing. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman still here. And then we'll come back for another round after these three. Uh -huh. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an interesting perspective. 
Uh, so, uh, my name is Amish and I'm a PhD student uh, at the School of Environment Education Development. So, uh, and I'm from Pune. So, uh, yeah. So, I just wanted to know, uh, for this sort of uh, alliance to work and to be successful, uh, how much importance would you place on the fact that uh, the institutional capacity of the cities that were chosen was highly enhanced as well as the fact that uh, the, the civil society is very active in, uh, in these uh, cities, especially Pune. And uh, uh, one more question, uh, like you could just elaborate on that, is uh, doesn't this sort of alliance delay the process of uh, policy implementation? In this case, it, it was the same government that was there at the center for 10 years. But because when a, when a government changes in India, the uh, previous policy is done away with. So instead of uh, having good houses, there would be no houses. Is like a question. Thank you. Thank you. You've got three questions in, uh, in that bird. Did you? Okay. okay. Did I you think so. I'll check the set last one. So you were asking about the problem uh, that when you have a process of upgrading, people can sell their land. So this is a widely recognised problem. Uh, Actually, I was, last week I was in Nairobi, and it, one of the things that's gone on there is redevelopment around the railways. And the people who were displaced have been offered apartments. And even 18 months later, I think about 16% of these families are now renting out these apartments. So absolutely, this is a major problem. I guess the problem is you, the groups that are working on some kind of inclusive shelter solution try and address this particular problem in three ways. First is they try and avoid individual tenure. Because if people have individual land tenure and they face a crisis, they are very likely to, to sell a house because they have no choice. Having a collective land title, so having some kind of community process that can mediate that becomes quite critical. Just get them to delay a bit, get them to think more about what they might want to do. Secondly, that one of the modalities that the Indian Alliance uses, which other groups in various themes also try and use, is trying to be a bit more holistic. So the Indian Alliance uses savings, uses savings to try and give people a little bit more financial security, and savings obviously can help in a crisis, and it can provide you with opportunities for income generation. So trying to think through some kinds of collective tenure, trying to think about a holistic intervention that is not simply housing, but which also has benefits and repercussions for livelihoods are really important. Those two things are important. There was a third thing that I was going to say, but I've forgotten. Um, what was the third thing that groups typically do? Yeah, the third thing they do is actually quite interesting, and that is to try and make your property unattractive to those of a higher income that might want it. So what are the ways you can make it unattractive? You can actually try and make it small. So you might sell a smaller plot, not a large plot. Smaller plots are better because you can include more people if you're developing an informal area, for example. But often high income groups are not interested in small parcels. So innovative groups that are committed to a process in which low income people will be encouraged to stay try and address the problem you raised, but it is recognized as a problem. The second question was about whether civil society can kind of cover up for the inadequate state. I think one of the things that any civil society organization that is trying to address the problem at scale recognizes is they can't cover up for an inadequate state. They have to try and drag the state with them. And they, have to, they can do that by trying to get the state to think through some of the more dysfunctional programs they design. Sometimes they do it through professional interventions, actually saying, well, okay, you may want to try and relocate people, but look at this evidence, it doesn't work. Sometimes they do it through organizing communities across the city to come together and look at the ways in which state policy is being developed. So looking at, say, the early 90s, what was going on in Rio de Janeiro, there was a program that was designed to only help 10% of people living in favela areas. So one of the things that the, actually then it was community federations did was to bring all the communities together and to get them to engage with the state. 
And when they engaged together, they no longer stopped trying to be the one in the 10%. Instead, they started to challenge the way in which the state was thinking. So there are indeed NGOs and charities that do small-scale individual housing solutions that absolutely try and substitute from the state. But there are many groups that recognize they can't do that. They simply cannot do that. But they cannot solve the housing problem. They've got to try and bring the state with them. But that involves often getting close to groups which you might not want to get that close to. It's a difficult challenge. I think the, the issue about why, why this question you raise about Pune is relatively wealthy. Pune, it is relatively developed institutionally. Pune has the advantage that it tends, it's seen as the place where very smart administrative officers go and just experiment with being very smart. So there are a lot of innovations. It's, it's seen as having a lot of benefits. And certainly there was a recognition among those we talked to that those benefits could not be ignored. But the general consensus was that it wasn't so much or, or that maybe the benefits had led to greater capacity and greater capacity had helped to catalyze more capacity. But there was a strong sense, actually a very consistent sense, that one of the things that had got Pune to the point it was, was being in a state that had devolved responsibilities to it. So it wasn't so much that enhanced capacity led to the devolution of responsibilities, which led to more capacity. It was the devolution of responsibilities forced city authorities to get their act together. The more tricky thing, actually, was another argument that was put forward why Pune was successful, which is why it's good you raised this question. And that was a sense that perhaps it was possible to do this in Pune because so much wealth was being generated elsewhere in the city that the kinds of people who tried to generate wealth from low-income settlements were not interested in Pune's low-income settlements. So there is a sense, perhaps, that the positive findings in Pune are related to the wealth and pro relative wealth and prosperity of that city. But I would just argue that the findings from Bhubaneswa, where you also saw the ability of civil society to catalyze a more pro-poor agenda, albeit at a much smaller scale, are also interesting. One of the things I think your question also highlights to me is quite a long-standing argument, which actually goes back, David, to some of your work, which is, what is the relationship between NGOs and the state? And there is quite a body of literature that says, actually, NGOs, civil society and the state, are, are not substitutes for each other, but are complements. A strong state tends to lead to a strong civil society because it is willing to invest in dialogue, invest resources, create opportunities. So there's a, a kind of argument that those two institutions, those two sectors, tend to enhance each other. They're complements, they're not substitutes. Okay, um, we've got time for another round of questions. There's one hand up here quite quickly. Is there anybody on this side? Oh, yeah, a second question over here then. So we start with our colleague in the check shirt down here. Thank you so much. My name is Abdullah. Uh, my question about the selection criteria, because you said uh, you saw uh, the, the program solved a small portion of, uh, of the, the, whole pro the, whole, the whole problem. And uh, if, you, if you can focus on uh, selecting the group, so uh, is there any, uh, within the selection criteria, is there any, uh, is there any tackling for the groups uh, uh, with their background or, uh, for instance, if, if a group of people coming from the same tribe or from the same religion or from, from, from the same background, is that going to uh, uh, make some problems or not? Uh, so if you can uh, uh, explain s s s s something about the selection criteria. Yeah, the question is, um, over the next coming years and decades, how successful do you think groups like this and similar groups would be in influencing the right kind of policy changes when some of these huge, huge cities are often expanding at a kind of uncontrollable rate? 
Hi. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. um, so I'm Fatima from Pakistan, and um, I'm from Karachi. And in my city, there are many informal settlements. But the thing is, most of those settlements are from people who have migrated from the rural areas to the city. And uh, most of the people in the city, as well as the state, they, they don't want that because it's leading to a lot of congestion. Uh, so my question is, now by improving the facilities that these people get, are you actually encouraging more of that migration? That, that would lead to a lot more congestion. So how can you deal with those things, you know, alongside each other? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Should we pass those questions okay. over to you then? Yeah. So the selection criteria is an interesting question. In order to understand the selection, you have to understand that there were settlements that were selected and there were people that were inside the settlements that were selected. So it's kind of a dual level. One of the frustrating things for people who really saw the BSUP as a little bit of a, of a more progressive program was the, the, the deadlines, the, the time within which they were first expected to complete the project was relatively short. That skewed the selection to places where there was a reasonably secure land tenure, i.e. when the state moved people they could do something with the land, or the land was needed for infrastructure. So the settlements that were selected were not necessarily those who were most in need. They were those that had a particular tenure uh, that the city had tenure over or that they needed infrastructure. How were households within those settlements selected? One of the things about in situ upgrading, which is why I put up this picture, is that you kind of include everyone who's got a claim on the plot. There is a bit of a separate discussion I won't go into about tenants and landlords, which was actually not a particular problem in this settlement. But informal settlement upgrading, because it is about upgrading the existing population, generally, makes, generally means that people are not displaced. Sometimes they are, but that's spatially determined because of where their plots lie. In the, in, in the medium rise, there were generally some households that were displaced. They weren't particularly from what I recall, is placed around ethnic groups. There was a gender issue. So, for example, women may have found it harder to get loans, and they needed loans in order to be allocated an, a, a plot. Some, you needed to make some kind of financial contribution, initially 10%, but it rose in these two cities, particularly Bhopal and Vizad. And people who couldn't afford that were also displaced. So those were the main criteria why some were selected. Some of the allocations, it was people complained to us were a little bit less random and they felt that they were, some families were being pushed out and some families of well-connected politicians were being pushed in. So there were other concerns, particularly actually in a city of Patna. Okay, next question. Um, how successful in growing cities? I mean... There is growing urbanization, but some growing urbanization has already happened for a long time. <coughs> the, one of the challenges is that actually what is successful or not is quite different, difficult to determine. Because you, if you take a snapshot of a process, you can often get quite a misleading understanding of how the trend is developing. So you need to have a really longitudinal analysis of how is housing program and policy developing, who is involved in it, who is influencing what. And it can be quite tricky to work out at any particular moment in time how, who has determined a policy. One of the reasons why it's tricky is that sometimes civil society persuades politicians to do something, but they can't own that. They have to kind of give ownership to the politician. <coughs> so attribution can be particularly difficult. I think, so those two problems, there's actually a methodological problem about how to work out who's influencing what, and there's a methodological problem that these things swing around a lot, and if you take a snapshot, you could be, think everything's very good or think everything's terrible. <coughs> One of the interesting things about housing is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, governments in general can be persuaded to make a commitment to housing. And indeed, many governments are recognizing that they need to do more in this area. They, they are motivated 
to solve the problem, but they often recognize that they're not being successful in solving the problem. So, for example, if they want to try and attract external development finance, they have to show they're targeting low-income groups, but they can struggle to do that. So the ability of civil society depends in part on how it can construct an answer which addresses the problems that officials and politicians are facing. So it depends in part on the ability, in my view, it depends in part on the ability of civil society to be able to address political needs. Political needs being A, to be effective, and B, to be seen to be effective. These two things are not always the same. And finally, um, okay, so Karachi and migration. Um, Karachi has a particular but not unusual, actually, sadly, not unusual challenge around migration. That Quite a lot of the migration is displacement from conflict. In those cases, it's very difficult to deal. I mean, it, whatever you, you, you do, it's hard to deal with it. Often you ha can have quite large numbers of people coming into an urban space and very little provision to begin to deal with them. There are quite large numbers of informal settlements in Karachi that have been regularized. So people who moved decades ago, that have gradually become part of the formal fabric of the city. And there are settlements that could be regularized, which are not being regularized, because the process is too bureaucratic and people don't get their act together. One of the common policy responses is that investing in urban areas just encourages migration. So your question is very timely. It's seen as one of the reasons why government uses, why government is reluctant to invest. I think I would make two comments about that. Firstly, that much of urban growth is natural increase. So much of urban gro growth is actually not migration. It's existing families multiplying. It's a major contributor to urban growth. The second is that we know that when urban growth declines, so when urban growth is less, you do get the reverse migration. So it is rarely the case, I would say, most people who work in urban areas rarely observe that people move to urban areas because they're housing and services. Most people move because they think they're employment opportunities, they're income generation opportunities excluding those who are displaced by conflict. When you see the economy shift, when you see recession in urban areas, when people struggle to realize those opportunities, then you see reverse migration. You actually can see urban to rural migration being greater to rural to urban migration. So the argument is not that, it's not that strong that this will attract people, the kind of bright lights argument. What is clear is that if you, if, you, if you want to achieve a context in which people can access their basic needs, so if you want to recognize the rights of citizenship and justice around access to adequate housing, access to basic services, then you cannot afford to enable informal settlements to continue without uh, investment. At the same time, if you want a prosperous urban economy, then you have to think about what are the ways in which people are able to participate in labor markets. What are the costs that people face because they have no adequate sanitation and because they don't have piped water, because they have to walk considerable distance to work because so there's no affordable transport? So there are considerable costs to in maintaining people in a situation of impoverishment, shelter impoverishment. So this kind of dual argument, the instrumental argument that, in a sense, there's a high cost to towns and cities through not investing, and a recognition there are issues of justice and redistribution around sharing resources and helping ensure that everyone, child and adult, has what they need to make the most of their life. So those two factors are both important. But the core factor, of course, the core factor driving an investment is mass housing, is, is the fact that governments want, or governments, democratic governments recognize that they have to build a platform of electoral support so they're interested in engaging with the needs that people who live in these areas face. Time just for a last couple of questions. Put your hand up if you've got a, a, a question and we let Diana sum up. But anybody like a final question? Okay, do you want to say any final words? Uh, no, not really. Just maybe one or two. I just say thank you for all your questions and thank you for the...
your rich engagement. I think between you, you've managed to hit some of the key challenges. The fact that the world is urbanizing, more than 50% urban, and it's increasing already. The fact that people live in informal settlements, often with great neglect. The challenge really to craft a way forward that is scalable and is of adequate quality. So I'd just like, I think, to finish by thanking you for your attention. Hopefully you enjoyed this start and you'll enjoy the rest of the seminar series. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not allowed to leave until I've pointed this out to you, but we've got Danny uh, Roderick, a world-famous economist, uh, coming up next. Uh, I shouldn't miss that because it's going to be a really exciting uh, lecture. And uh, I've got a whole lecture of notes here, but I'm not going to make a lecture. I'd just like to say, could we say thank you to Diana again, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time.